Take it away. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's such a great pleasure to be here in Atlas today. Uh, Professor Doe's and Ellen's work. Sorry. Sorry, sorry for the glitch, I'm really sorry for that. Okay, Professor Mark and Ellen Gross works have heavily inspired my work on sketching directly in place several of my projects. And of course, they have influenced my way of thinking towards sketching interfaces. So it's a great pleasure to be here. Today, I'd like to talk about, you know, some of the graphical user interfaces <clears throat> for design and animation. But I won't get into the details, but I want to give uh, a broad overview about the possibilities and scope in this domain. So a little bit about <clears throat> where I come from. I'm from Adobe Research, and Adobe Research is, has almost 100 plus researchers across many locations, and we have pretty good presence in top-tier academic conferences, as you can see, in top-tier computer vision, HCI, and graphics. Adobe has a good presence, and most of this, almost all of these are done by our intern, PhD intern researchers. And in addition to that, because we are at Adobe, we also contribute to many high profile product features, like last week, we Adobe Photoshop released neural filters, which also came from the product rooms that helps you to manipulate facial images. At the same time, Adobe's Fresco's beautiful watercolor painting engine are also done by physics-based simulation from research group. And last week, we, our group also won the Emmy Engineering Award for you know uh, making contribution to live TV animation. In this case, there is a live TV show, and the Photoshop cartoon is brought to life by Adobe Character Animator, where someone is actually animating in real time behind the camera to animate the character. All right. So broadly, I'm really excited about the potential of computer graphics and how it will contribute to the evolution of human language. So let's start with some of the terminologies. What do I mean by language, right? So let's take, these are some examples of language, right? <clears throat> we use language to write down ideas, to speak with the others, to communicate with others. We use visual diagrams to see patterns in complex data. And we use mathematical notations to deal with abstractions and higher level of uh, higher dimensions. You know, I mean, we figure out how the universe works, not by just looking at the things, but also like dealing with these levels of abstraction and mathematical notation. Now, the important thing is our language has evolved for thousands of years, but mostly it is developed for static medium. Another important thing is our intellectual capabilities are directly influenced by the uh, capabilities of our language. Imagine if we have a very few words in our English vocabulary, it would limit our thinking, right? Now let's take a look at how computer graphics can uh, enhance our language. For instance, assuming that we all wear headsets or do video communication, computer graphics can enhance our real-time conversations or presentations through graphics or it can really create embedded visualizers to help us understand how the dynamics work, what is the abstract representations of a physical phenomena. And it would really help us to sketch and ideate in a dynamic computational medium with natural gestures, speech, and other modalities and sketch, of course. But today, creating dynamic graphics is very challenging, right? We need you know, very specialized tools. It needs hours and hours of preparation. But what would it take to make interactive computer graphics a truly ubiquitous dynamic uh, medium, right? What would it take? I believe we need to make it spontaneous. Spontaneous means we should be, it's like whiteboard sketching. We should be able to create dynamic interactive graphics in the speed of our thought, just like sketchboard, just like whiteboards. When you're sketching and white, in a whiteboard, when you're ideating, we don't think about the interface we're focusing on the idea itself. And that's how dynamic computer graphics should be. 
So to make computer graphics spontaneous, we need, of course, a new human-centered letter language driven by, you know, new interaction techniques, mapping, parameterizations, and conceptual tools. And that's what we will talk today. Now, my journey in this field started because, you know, as an undergraduate, I was very much into comics and drawings. And I used to draw uh, comics by myself when I was an undergraduate and work in many cartoon uh, newspapers and draw billboards. And, you know, it, as a matter of fact, I wrote my PhD thesis as a comic book to portray, you know, science ideas in the form of uh, art and storytelling. And, you know, as a growing adult, I was so fascinated by the animations of Pixar and Disney. And as a creator, I was really frustrated that, you know, I wish I could bring life to my characters and drawings. I was really frustrated by the limitations, limitations of static medium. But of course, giving life to your drawings is not an easy task it's because highly specialized skills, even though computer graphics has progressed a lot in the last 25 years, those are tailored for animation industries. What about people like us? So my research started about how can we make animation as easy as sketching, right? Which was, I was referring to spontaneity. So let's start. Uh, start by looking at some of the 2D uh, animation interfaces. The first one is Draco. It's actually a sketch-based tool uh, that brings life to drawings with sketching and dynamic textures. So this was a Kai 2014 paper, I believe, but this later turned into a product. So I will just show a, the, um, show a video of the iPad app itself. So here is the iPad app and interface. As you can see, uh, it's like any other drawing tool. There is this bunch of layers in the left and there's no time and keyframing. So I, as an artist, I drew some bubbles here and I draw a small line here to create a texture. So from my example bubbles, it created textures. And then I draw a few lines to, you know, to move, to change them and so on. But, you know, I want to uh, make the bubbles uh, bigger as they're moving. So I simply sketch. That's how I specify my intent, just sketching. And now I want a little bit of turbulence in the bubble. So what I do is that I actually pop up this menu, which shows a single bubble, and I record a motion again, a small motion by direct manipulation. And you see there's a turbulence in all the bubbles. There is a little jittering in all the bubbles. Now I want the bubbles to slow down as they're moving. So again, I draw another curve, which is the velocity over time. And then you see the bubbles are slowing down as they're moving. So you see, everything is by example. There is no physics, no underlying simulation. I am providing uh, animation capabilities in multiple skills. Now I want to animate the sea fish. I select the fish layer and draw a line and that creates another texture. We call it kinetic textures. Control, the, we have a few control like speeds and parameters. And then again, I want to add a bit, of, little bit of uh, up and down motion. So I directly record another motion to a single fish and that is being replicated to all the fishes. So we have motion controls over the entire textures as well as the individual elements, which gives us a lot of expressive power. So you see, it feels like we are drawing the animations, right? It doesn't feel like we are doing keyframing and it doesn't feel like we are using complex simulation tools. And the user is in absolute control because he's doing all the, uh, he's providing all the input. Another important thing is that, uh, you know, we are leveraging users intuitive sense of time and space. In a way, the user is performing to create all these animations. Again, in this case, for instance, the user is specifying, I want a rotation to the individual leaves and that's how the rotation is being replicated to all the leaves in the circuit. Now, I also authored a few other layers. I will just, they were animated beforehand. I will just make it visible and this is, will be the entire picture. So an animated drawing uh, created, I mean, without the artwork, just the animation part can be created literally within seconds and minutes. Here is the final artwork. And then, uh, as I said, this is a commercial product called Autodesk Sketchbook Motion and available in still in iPad. And we are glad that uh, every year Apple recognizes one app as the app of the year, the, as the best app of the year. And Sketchbook Motion was selected for 2016, the best app of the year for iPad category. And here are some other animations created by others.
so it's interesting to remember it's important to remember that you know animated drawing is a new medium itself it's not a video it's not traditional animation it doesn't have a start it doesn't have an end it's it's like picture it's timeless so that's why when we have to design tools for a medium like this we have to think about animation and interactivity in new ways compared to traditional 2d animation tools that we have seen in the past few years what for me one of the interesting thing that i learned is that i as a researcher when when we were developing the tool i was really excited to how can we help artists and animators to really quickly rapidly animate ideas bring life to their drawings but when we released the app we found that it's being used by architects to demonstrate you know designs by civil engineers by educators you know by science teachers and all sorts of people and that was really an eye-opening uh, realization for me that animation is such a universal powerful dynamic medium and it's very important to keep in mind and keep that in mind and the recognition of apple as the best app of is a testament to that statement now we have seen uh, we have seen how to bring life to drawings by animation but as i said when you are thinking about a medium like this it's important to think what kind of ideas and thoughts we can express with this medium right for instance can we specify how a thing work can you specify can we sketch an algorithm right it's really important to think about the expressiveness of the medium and another dimension is can we even make them interactive right as a viewer i do not just consume it passively i interact with the drawing to see how things work so our next uh, project kitty looked at how to make drawings interactive and here is a demo of an interactive drawing a viewer is interacting this is a this is a scene and as a viewer you see i can interact with the drawing when i'm moving the wind wheel it's emitting water when i'm doing a tap gestures it's it's creating some wind and as i move it faster it, the wind is going faster and eventually as a result the windmill is rotating even faster and emitting more water so as a viewer i can understand how things work right but how can we create an experience like this so kt is built on top of sketchbook motion and which is draco so here is how this works this is an animated drawing and we want to make it interactive right so what i would do is that i want the viewers to be able to manipulate the egg and the egg will be able to fall in the pot but when the it falls in the pot there will be some effects there will be a splash happening so i want to author that cause and behavior now again i said what kind of ideas you can express right so that's where parameterization and mapping comes in so each of the elements or entity entities are in this case are illustrated as nodes and you know each of the nodes has different types of attributes like spatial attributes anime uh, temporal attributes even quantitative attributes visual attributes so in this case what i have map is two variables which is like the movement of the egg it the splash will be zero but at some point the splash value will be have a certain value so you see the splash is happening only when the egg hits the surface of the soup so that's one edge now i want to control the fire as well right if i rotate the knob there will be more fire and if there's more fire there will be more smoke again i do a quickly par some parameter binding again as i said i think the choice of parameters is important here because it relates to what can we expect you see as you're moving the parameters fire there's more fire and there's more smoke so this is how we create an interactive animation interactive illustration uh, using these uh, uh, node and edge diagrams and this is the underlying thing so this is again an animated drawing there is no interactivity here but we want to make it data driven so that when we move this thing about the calendar we can see how the weather looks like so basically we want to make it an infographic so again we have actually brought a um, data from the data file and then as we are mapping the attributes from the calendar to the amount of snow we are actually deriving this relationship from the data in this case we are not sketching the relationship we are uh, generating this from the underlying data attributes and then you see uh, as in the monday there's not much snow but in the weekend where you're supposed to go out and hang out with friends there's more snow and windy so this is a comic strip that shows how things change but you can consolidate into a single 
animated drawing. As you can see, the users can interact either with the plant or the clock to make it animated. So imagine the our you know the, the, the everyday diagrams we experience in in the papers, you know, in in textbooks, in website. Imagine we could make this interactive. We could make we could interact with it to understand how things work. Imagine we as an author could make our illustrations interactive in our paper presentation and even others. So um, the kitty, uh, this is how where uh, kitty looks at um, the interactivity. So here are some really simple ideas. I'm, I, I was really surprised to see like what the users created. This is like how a juice blender works. The sketches are not like it's really low fidelity sketches, but the idea is so clear. And I was really impressed to see that the, that participant was able to create that, that artifact. In, in in a matter of minutes. Some other animated. This is an animated example of animated gift cards. This is an example of how car steering wheel works. All right. Now we have seen how to bring life to the drawings, but when we really think about life, we when we think about life, we I mean one of unfortunately the video is not playing here. Um, we look at Disney animations, right? And there's a really a sense of illusions, right? The way they're doing the deformation as if like the artists can, artists are bringing magic to it. So, you know, the interfaces we have looked so far, there is not that sense of life. I mean, we have done direct manipulations. We have seen interactivity, but we want to really bring the life that Disney animators bring into, a, into an animated cartoon. So that, means that we have to add another layer of interactions. But again, we don't want to get into keyframing and complex simulation tools. Fortunately, there are already some guidelines. This is an example of the 12 principles of Disney animation. And this is a book written in the 70s or 80s that, that talks about how these different principles guide the deformation, the storytelling, the timing, and other aspects of the animations, right? So this really gives us inspiration. Okay, like let's use these principles and make them really easy to understand and apply for animators to use or for artists to use. And that leads to our project motion amplifiers. So before getting into the interface, let's think what's happening inside an animator's hand, right? How would an animator create, for instance, this animation? He would first apply follow through, right? And then he will apply staging. And then maybe he will apply a little bit of slow in, slow out just to control the timing and then squash and stretch. And when you combine all this, all these things, you get something like this. So this is how things work inside an animator set. So we expose in motion amplifier user interface, we expose these, um, these principles of animation as we call animation filters, as you can see on the top of the interface. So what we do is that we draw a simple bird and then record a motion just like the previous interface, but again, it's just moving, there's no life into it. Then we apply a little bit of slow in and slow out and that controls the timing of it, right? So now we have some timing, we control the amount of slow and slow. Now I apply a little bit of uh, squash and stretch and you can see a little bit of squash and stretch happening with the motion, right? I, I can exaggerate each of the amplifiers a little bit by controlling the knobs. Finally, I'd like to, specify follow through, I specify rigid part of the body. And then the system actually applies the deformation to the rest part of the body. So now, and finally I apply staging, which is actually the line. So in a, in a, in a few, uh, with a few tweakings from a simple rigid motion, we get something like this. Here is another example. I draw a simple shark and I specify that this will have an arc motion. So I select arc and then I actually record the motion, right? And because I specified arc, it will deform as it is moving. Now I apply slow in, slow out, and you can clearly see the timing. And then finally, I you can control the knob a little bit to apply slow in, slow out. I apply staging that, that highlights the motion with, and then finally at anticipation that the fish will go back before going forward. And I can even control with gestures, like what is the posture I want the fish to go back in. And again, we get an animation like this very quickly and easily. 
And interesting thing is there's no rigging happening here. Everything is happening on free from sketches, which is the key idea there. And this is the resulting animation. All right, so here is an animation done with the previous interfaces, direct manipulation. But just by adding motion filters, if I add two motion filters, squash and stress flow and slow, this is how it looks like. And if I add another one, two, this is how it looks like. And you know, there's a, a long list of works in educational, like led by similar papers and other similar computer visions. What is the role of the teacher? And I mean, we took this, this inst um, interface, took direct inspiration from this line of work is to create the conditions for invention, right? Then to provide ready-made knowledge. So as an animator artist, even if you're not familiar with the principle of animations, you are learning by doing, you are learning by experimenting with all these different amplifiers and you get you develop an intuition of what each principle adds and takes away from an animation. For instance, this is an animation with four amplifiers. If I take away the drag, this is how it looks like. And if I take it, the remaining amplifiers, this is how it looks like. So this kind of experiments helps us to build deep intuition about the principles of animation or any specialized, any specialized knowledge and field. So you know, another in, in the do domain of animation, another really important area is secondary animation. It's in computer graphics, it's a very canonical problem. Like right? it's a, uh, you know, how do you stylize with physics? It's a very challenging problem, right? Because physics do not follow stylizations. So we also took inspiration from a really old work that talks about, you know, how in the 70s, in pen and paper, how the animators used to design these elemental, uh, this type of, um, this type of effects. The, the interesting thing is that, you know, they didn't use any simulation tool, but these energy lines used to help them to stylize and exaggerate, right? Again, they used to do keyframing, but these are their mental tools. So we thought, okay, now, how can we take inspiration from this, but build similar type of tool for a digital media? So it's you know, it's a different media, it's interactive and dynamic. So that led to our work to energy brushes. And this is how the interface works. So you see, we, we uh, to create the secondary animation effects, what we do is that we use these simple uh, sketches and, and they emit these particles and each particles create certain types of velocity field. Very simple, right? There's no physics, there's no, you know, um, complexity into it. So this is the type of energy fields you can create. Now let's put some drawings into the scene and see how these energy brushes affects these uh, uh, artworks. Now let's control some of the parameters and you can control the, you know, obviously, the speed, the size of the particles, the frequency, and etc. Cetera, et cetera. And you have direct feedback about how things work, right? Now, uh, let's take a look at this. As, a, as an interface, this falls somewhere between sketch-based interfaces and simulation. Now, let's take a look at how can we create a wave animation. So I start with some very simple pattern, right? And then, uh, Manipulate the parameter again, very simple. And then I add another key uh, energy burst on top of it. Because it's animated, it's because it's interactive, we get real time feedback. And I add another one, another one, and another one. And now we have a wave animation like this from very simple animation primitives. So complexity arises by composing this very simple understandable primitives. So unlike traditional, you know, physics-based um, animation tools that have been explored in the graphics community, this is a, takes a very different approach. This is more like you are sketching the secondary dynamics with these small understandable primitives. And because you are creating complexity with these understandable primitives, you have a deep understanding and a sense of control. You can stylize it, exaggerate it. You can use it at will, which is very challenging to do it otherwise. Some other animation effects here. Uh, let me show you one more example. So in this case, you know, I draw one energy brush to create the cape. And then I draw another energy brush to, you know, uh, to add that like 
to add another motion at the end of the cape. And the third one to get a periodic gust into the cape. And this is how the resulting animation looks like. So we could also animate existing pictures. We could just crop certain parts of it and animate those corresponding things. Again, using these energy brushes. So the really the principle is, you know, uh, the conceptual tools what we refer to is that how can we break down complex phenomena into this mind size bias, which make things problems more communicable, assimilable, and constructible, right? Which is the major principles. Uh, you know. So far, we have looked at conceptual tools that helps us to deal with complexity in the context of animation. But one interesting problem is that, you know, in a dynamic medium, as I said, we have developed many diagrams, uh, many mathematical notation, abstraction, representations for static media over past hundreds of years. How do we develop new types of mental tools for these other domains like mathematics, physics, chemistry, or other specialized domains? Or more importantly, how do we design tools that you know help these people from different disciplines to create this type of representations? I think that's something that's a really important and interesting research problem here. So talking about spontaneous computer graphics, we have looked at how can we make animations really easy and accessible by you know new interaction techniques with by leveraging space-time uh, animation techniques by sketch-based animation techniques. How to make make them interactive using novel mapping and parameterization and how can we deal complex dynamics by the use of conceptual tools like uh, energy brushes and the principles of animation but like many other people i'm also excited to look forward beyond 2d and what it means in 3d i stole this slide from uh, you know herve benko who was talking about you know how a new computing era is defined and according to him which i kind of agree with him is a new computing era is defined by new input methods and new interactions in addition to display form factors. As you can see in the history of computing from common line to graphical user interfaces and from graphical user interfaces to touch and gesture and tablet interfaces. And probably we are moving to more wearables using headsets like AR and VR glasses. So now we have a very different input modality, right? We have, if we have variable, we will be, should be used, we should be able to use our hand gestures and other, uh, other modalities to interact with computer graphics. So what does it mean? I would also like to show a few our exploration, similar motivation, but just different, uh, different context, different input modalities. So one premise is like this setting, right? How can we enhance our communication and live video storytelling? You know, I'm using PowerPoint, unfortunately, which is developed for the 90s. It's really, uh, but you know, in this new new era, <laughs> like uh, video conferencing, how would a PowerPoint tool would look like? One motivating example is this one. This is actually Hans Rosling talking about the relationship of you know population and uh, their uh, population income and their lifespan. So you see, it feels like the graphics are a natural extension of his uh, body and gestures, right? He's manipulating them in real, uh, uh, he's manipulating them with their gestures and speeches and using your uh, whole body to interact with the graphical elements. But in this case, it's not real time, it's post-production. He requires specialized crew to create these things. But from an interaction standpoint, the question is, you know, what is the interaction language here? What kind of gestures we would like to use? What kind of interactions are possible in this space? And what kind of interaction even makes sense? So there's a paper from Eigner et al. Uh, so it's not that old paper that explored, you know, the type of gestures people use. They did a study where they were asked to, where a participant was asked to convey a particular idea to another participant without any speech using the gestures only. And based on all the gestures people use, they actually classified what that is different type of gestures people use for communicating, right? That's give us a good idea about the uh, space. So did directly influence our work, which is actually augmenting live videos. So this is a Kai 2019 paper, which is a paper that augments live videos like the one I'm doing now, but with interactive computer graphics. So the graphics and the PowerPoint presentations and the person is not separated, but they're combined into a single screen and the graphics are interactive in real time. 
So here it how it works. We prefer to slide some beforehand and do some simple mapping. Like in this case, I'm saying that the, uh, the, the umbrella should be in my hand. And this is how the slide looks like during presentation time. Here's another slide where the person is saying that, you know, I should be able to manipulate this thing to, uh, to control the slide. And this is how it looks like when the person is presenting. And this is the setup where you know we use a connect to detect the gesture uh, to detect the person, and the person sees himself in the presenter. Again, in the, we found that the presenter needs a lot of control to specify where he wants to control the graphics when he doesn't want to. So there is also a variable clicker that helps the presenter to control the, all these different things: previous click and then active or inactive, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And our key contribution in this course is actually the mapping, right? The mapping, again, it's all about parameterization and mapping, mapping between the interaction techniques to all the graphical outputs. I won't get into the details, but we figure um, we dev devised the direct manipulation interface to do this uh, mapping interactions. And here, uh, here's my favorite part, which is how the participants use this language. So in this case, this participants is actually explaining how to prepare ramen egg in one minute, <laughs> ramen noodles. And this is actually a Harvard student who presented his whole research paper using the system. And he's actually used his real results from the paper and presented it. This is another person who is actually brainstorming how she should arrange her interior design. So in this case, you can see the graphics feels like a, a natural extensions of their body. It doesn't feel like they're interacting with the graphics. They're interacting with another person through the video and the graphics or elements are actually augmenting it. So we 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 explored this, you know, this um, this interface from a computer graphics perspective, but I think there's many open questions, right? How to drive users attention, how to make sure that the users are not overwhelmed with all the graphical elements. How do the gestures work in conjunction with speech, for instance, or other modalities? So there's a lot of interesting research questions there still to be explored. All right, so we have looked at an interface that helps prepare for a person to create all these things beforehand, but the presentations need to be highly scripted, right? There's no room for improvisation. What if, if I decide, okay, I need to create a graphics now based on the question someone has asked me, right? What if, if we want to improvise things in real time? What if, if we go to a discussion without any slides and preparation beforehand? Then that's what we refer as spontaneous graphics, right? Let's take a, take a look at a motivating example. Imagine someone is teaching a pendulum a class um, and teaching how the pendulum motion works, right? So in this case, he or she will be able to take a real physical pendulum and map its value to a virtual graphic. So what is the problem here? Again, the problem is about parameterization and mapping. The system needs to know that this is the pendulum we're interested in. The system needs to know that there's the angle that more specifically we're interested in. We want to track the value of the angle. And then the system needs to know that, you know, that as the pendulum is moving, we have to visualize that angle in real time. So it's about, we need to parameterize the physical world in real time to do this type of interactions. So Ryo Suzuki from University of Colorado Boulder joined us as an intern last year and did an excellent project in this space. And some of you might be familiar with it, but I'll just quickly show the video in case you haven't seen it. So this is in collaboration with Daniel Lettinger as well, who is also from UC Boulder. So in this case, you see, there is a teacher who is teaching and there's an assistant who is actually interacting with the keyboard because the teacher can, himself cannot do the interactions. And the assistant is actually doing interactions. The assistant is specifying that, okay, we're interested in the pendulum and we have created, I have drawn two lines and what we're interested in is this particular angle. So he's actually drawn three lines to specify, this is the angle in, interested in. Now, what the teacher wants to do is actually show the, that the pendulum creates a simple harmonic simulation, and then creates a chart, and then uh, and then the uh, assistant actually maps the angle to the y-axis. And now, as the angle is changing, we're seeing that how this value changes in real time. 
So this type of interactions enable a wide range of possibilities in many application routines, uh, domains. We will see some other examples as well. So here is a simple example of another how it works, right? So the person first selects the object in interest. In this case, you know, this is the marker. This is actually the light source. And then sketch two things. And then this end of the line is actually attached to the topic. You see, as I'm moving the angle and the length of the object is changing. I do another angle, but you know, they're not directly related. So we actually specify the both of the angle as the same name and now they are binded together. Now, as I move one, you see the other one. And then now we see how the reflection works, right? So you can also see some other possibilities there, like how can we use this type of interactions to do physics experiments? You know, sometimes physics, the problem with physics experiments and classroom settings is that they're disconnected, right? I mean, you do experimentations in the physical world, but you do the mapping and all the other activities in pen and paper or computers, and they're kind of disconnected with each other. And, this type of interfaces or interactions could really bring them together. And you can see in real time how the abstract phenomena uh, connects with the actual physical phenomena. So in this case, this shows the relationship between the two angle. And as you move things, you get the better understanding, OK, this is how the size of the motor affects the rotation, the amount of the rotation. Now, in this particular project, we have explored very simple parameters, which is an object. But if we really expand the vocabulary of parameters, for instance, what is the number of objects, for instance, or like other types of phenomena, like the amount of light in the scene, or you know, the 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 the, the, the way things are deformed, this opens up many new possibilities. So it, again, it depends on how we parameterize things in real world and map them to create interactive graphics in real time to help us understand how these things work. All right, so we have looked uh, in the AR and VR, we have looked at uh, communication, right? The role of dynamic interactive computer graphics, communications. Uh, now, how do we sketch an idea? That's how we started with, right? Like I, when I'm ideating things, if I want to create animations or create some sort of like representation of a dynamic phenomena, how do we uh, sketch things in a medium like this? So this motivated our uh, another work, Magical Hands, that looks at how can we use hand gestures to create animation phenomena. Now, this is a very exciting time because most many of the AR, VR, and wearables are equipped with um, hand gesture recognition. So this opens up enormous interaction possibilities. But the thing is, what do we do with it? Even though there are many gesture-based interaction works in HCI, there are very few of them about mid-ear gestures. We have a very uh, little understanding about, you know, all the degrees of freedom and and hand gesture um, uh, and the user's preferences. So we perform a study to understand how people would like to perform uh, gestures to portray certain animated phenomena, right? So what we did is that we invited participants. We asked, we gave them this different animated phenomena and asked them how do we portray this animation using hand gestures? So in this case, you see these animations are more like physics-based and particle systems. So there is no direct mapping in many cases uh, from hand gestures to this animated sp space-time attributes. And we were really surprised to see how people use their hands. Sometimes they use direct manipulations. In many cases, they use both hands, right? And different degrees of freedom of their hands. Sometimes they use very gestural, very abstract uh, uh, gestures. In this case, it's not direct manipulation. It's more like signal, right? So the range of gestures was really interesting from direct manipulations to abstract demonstrations. More concretely, we found some, we uh, contributed a gesture set that, uh, uh, that actually contributes some interesting gestures. For instance, when people use two hands, if I want to rotate an object, one hand to specify the axis, and the other hand to specify the rotation, for instance. Sometimes people use both hands to sculpt the shape of an animation. Like I want the particle system to move from here to here. And sometimes people use abstract demonstration, as I mentioned, like, okay, this is the emission. This is the frequency of the emission. 
So uh, this paper also talks a lot about the design guidelines because again, this is such a new modality. What all this means, what are all, what all these degrees of freedom and finding mean for other things like sculpting and design. So based on that, we also develop a proof of concept prototype to show you how gestural animation systems would look like. So in this case, a person is putting a 3D model here in the scene and dragging an emitter. An emitter is a predefined construct, right? Now we want to change the particle type. So what we will do is that we will actually bring a new type of particle and that creates a different type of emission. Now we want to control the shape of the animation. So in this case, the user is performing with a bone hand and sculpting the shape of it so that the anim animation is more conical. And now you see, and then the user is actually doing another gesture to add some randomness. And then finally, another gesture, pointing gesture to uh, specify spiral. And this is how an animation is created, a 2D animation. There are plenty of other results in the paper, but feel free to take a look at this. Again, all these animations are created by first time users. People have never done animation before. So again, 3D animation is a very complicated task for those who, who for you who have experienced it. But I, all I'm trying to say is that these modalities in AR and VR is actually a big opportunity for us uh, to, to see like how can we leverage you know, this new input modalities, this increased bandwidth with many degrees of freedom uh, to leverage and uh, create new interaction techniques. Another important thing is that gestures doesn't need to uh, act alone, right? Maybe they will work with speech or other modalities. That's also another important thing. Uh, before moving, moving forward, I want to point out to this particular animation. Uh, you know, in this case, what the user is doing is that when the user is specifying this shape, he's doing a single gesture, but there's a plenty of information there. He's specifying the speed, at what speed the uh, smoke should go up. He's also specifying, you know, uh, the shape of the smoke, right? It should be conical. And then he's also specifying the turbulence with his fingers. So that's the key idea here. Like what is the information embedded in a single gesture? And as you can see, there are different layers of information because of the different degrees of freedom. And that's an opportunity from an interaction standpoint of view. All right, so, uh, so we have seen uh, the power and potential of interactive dynamic graphics. How can it enhance our real-time communication? We have seen how it has helped us to see new things by embedding visualizations in the real world and kind of abstract of concepts to the physical worlds. And we have also seen how it helps us to ideate in a digital medium with new input modalities rapidly and quickly, which is very challenging to do currently with desktop or tablet interfaces. You know, uh, moving forward, you know, we don't know in 50 years later, 100 years later, what will be the new frontiers of technology? What will be the new frontiers of science? What new knowledge frontiers will people pursue? We don't know. But it's very, I think people will have new representations, new knowledges, new ways to deal with complex concepts, new ways to deal with, you know, additional complexities and so on. So I think dynamic graphics, accessible dynamic graphics that all of us can use will pl play a critical role to help us, you know, ideate, to deal with complex concepts, to come up with new representations that are dynamic, that are computational, both in 2D and interfaces as well as here and VR interfaces. And so that's why I think this is a very important problem. How can we make dynamic graphics accessible across a wide range of domain for varied kind of knowledge tasks? So my works are highly inspired among many other researchers are by these people there. When I was a PhD student, their works and thoughts inspired me a lot throughout, throughout this kind of trajectory. And I'm very fortunate to work with some of the HCI and graphics finest. Um, so, and some of them are actually great uh, PhD students who came as a research intern and I had a chance to collaborate with them uh, as a PhD interns. So with that, I'd like to conclude talks and like to start um, uh, take, happy to take questions. Also an announcement, we're taking internship in case you're interested in this space.
Yeah. Have a question. Yeah, sure. Uh, have you tried to do this like uh, maybe a long fissure? Like making like a fissure film with this? <laughs> long, long, long. Uh, it sounds to me like you know, like they do with, you know, the term pre-visualization that you see on movies before they make the movie. It sounds like that type of tool. I wonder if you have, can you extend that into something bigger? Yes. Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, to be honest, we haven't yet. I, I, you know, I know there are uh, many cool examples in the film industry about how people use gesture interfaces. They look cool, but you know, there are many practical challenges. Uh, for instance, we figure out even though, even with our augmented uh, live video, augmented graphics, when we are sitting in a desktop, maybe we don't even need gestures, right? When we are doing a very long talk, maybe we could just interact with the graphics using keyboard and pen. Maybe you can interact with the speeches. Maybe you can say that, imagine what happens in the year of 1996 and the uh, slider will change accordingly. So I think really the interaction, the, the, the appropriateness of an interaction depends on the context, depends on the usage and depends on the setup. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's an important area that is worth investigating. Rubaya, really good to see you and I really enjoy that. And it looks to me like you're having way too much fun. And I'm actually kind of envious and jealous because uh, I wish I had been involved in inventing some of those. So I have, I have two questions, one a very nerdy, geeky, small question, and then one sort of a overarching large question. And I, I was going to try to do the Trump gestures with my hands, but I don't think I can do it quite right. Um, so the nerdy, geeky question is, does the order of application of these filters or these functions matter? So if I apply them in different orders, do you get different results? What's the algebra of those things? Yeah, the, at this, um, in the motion amplifiers, the orders doesn't really matter. And even in energy brushes, all the order doesn't matter because when we do the final compositing, we are composing a single uh, velocity field that's deforming all of those. And in case of motion amplifiers, also the ordering doesn't really matter. But in practice, in many cases, when we try to create even more complicated animation, yes, the order matters because it technically, it is very difficult to come up with the representations where the order doesn't matter. Or even sometimes it is very difficult to come up with a representation where you know they're, they're all composable. For instance, in character animator, Adobe based character, character animator, which as I said, on an Emmy Award this year, at some point the team find out that it's very difficult to compose everything at will. They have a, they have a set of behaviors that you could apply to artworks. So there is uh, there is some practical limitations there when you want to create really complex uh, complex things. So the overarching big question, I'm not quite sure I have the language for this right, but um, it looks like we're playing at the at the place where programming and performance art meet. So if you have people performing with gestures, they're actually kind of real life performance. And so sort of one of the superficial version of the question is what, what can system builders learn from performance artists? How can performance art and performance artists inform the design and building of these systems? And maybe a piece of that question is implicit in any system that we build are primitives and operations. And to the extent to which those primitives and operations match the way the performance artist thinks about things or are we changing the way performance artists think by giving them particular primitives. So there's this interesting interaction between these, what used to be a very nerdy programming domain and the very artsy, fun, wild. So sort of your thoughts on that as someone who's actually inventing at this intersection. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Uh, thank you very much for uh, bringing this up. Uh, I deeply care about that question and I, agreeably, I don't have the answer. But what I can say is that, you know, a lot of the motivation comes from embodied interactions. There's a long list of HCI works in these intersections that says that, you know, if you're programming something in a screen versus if you're doing the same thing using your physical body, it, it really matters how you think. The way, if you use your body, it really changes the way you think about a problem. So, Yes, I think embodied interactions, the, the idea behind the embodied interaction is the bridge between the, the performance and programming, right? How can we really leverage embodied interactions to do the things that we haven't done so far with performances? 
you know, since you mentioned Seymour a couple times, you know, his earlier work was having children learn to ride bongo balancing boards or bicycles or unicycles and trying to get yeah. at the knowledge that they had in there. Yeah, right, right. So what's next? <laughs> Um, you know, I, that's a very good question. You know, uh, you know, I work in Adobe and, you know, one of the things that really motivated me is that not just publishing idea, but to bring some of these ideas into fruition. So I think there's a lot more work to be done to really have a practical impact with these ideas. That's one of the big areas I'm really interested to focus in the next, uh, in the next uh, few years. I assume that, that, as I mentioned before, going back to what I asked you, I, I assume they'll be yeah. using this for uh, film production, isn't it? Yes, film production is, is obviously uh, one of the frontiers in this space. I mean, Disney already produced uh, their storyboards in VR, one of their storyboards in VR, which is really interesting. Uh, but I think, as I said, uh, beyond film, I mean, film technology is so advanced compared to other fields in terms of technology. I think another big opportunity for Adobe is to really, Adobe or for any of us is to bring this power to general people. I think that's a big opportunity. I mean, one of the things I learned, I, I joined a few Facebook group this year, uh, this year after the COVID outbreak. And I found people having so much trouble to connect to the students, to teaching them. I mean, it, it is so difficult, right? To communicate, even with Blue Jeans, there's so many practical challenges there. So yeah, I think there's a lot of work to be done to enhance human-to-human -human com communication, even within video conferencing. This is perfect for Zoom. We should do that right now, play with this thing. <laughs> I just downloaded the software. <laughs> yeah. On that line, I mean, I, I'd like to... Uh, talk a little bit about Mark and Ellen's prior work, Ambiguous Intentions. I think that is, is such a, one of my very favorite paper. That paper talks about the qualities of sketches. You know, sketches are ambiguous and incomplete. And it is very important to preserve those qualities of sketches, even in a computational medium. So that paper was in the 90s, I guess. But I think still a lot of work to be done. I mean, even when you work with the 3D, 3D design tools, when you draw something, it immediately interprets as a spline, but that's not the point, right? The point is, it is something like a spline, but it's not a spline. It's not something like a circular, but it's not a circle, maybe. So uh, I think preserving those qualities of these input modalities is very important. Well, thanks for that shout out. And, and anyone who wants to pursue that line of inquiry, come talk to us because I agree. That's that's much more work to be done. And it's gotten more complicated because the graphic tools are so much better and the uh, computation speed is so much better. And so, and the libraries are so much bigger, but they're also there where we had to write our own libraries. So yeah, I agree. And uh, you posted an internship opportunity. So I guess people who are interested could follow up with you on that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I don't think there's too many people here who are not from CU, but uh, I will point out that the University of Colorado Engineering College is hiring. We'd love to have a faculty member become part of Atlas. Uh, so spread the word. I'll put that in the chat if I can figure out how to do that. So if there's anybody at, at Adobe who um, wants to take a break and be in academia. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I will spread the word. <laughs> well, I can see Rahul Arora here. Rahul is, if he's in the call, Rahul has done many works, several of the works. Rahul was actually the first author of Magical Hands, and he has done some fantastic works in this space. He's also pushing the frontiers in this space.
Ellen, I think you're here now that you have internet. I think it's your job as host to thank the speaker. And yes, I'm meeting. sorry, my internet has been down. I got kicked out like trying to reconnect three, four times. So today is not my day. <laughs> I got kicked out. <laughs> but Rubaya, thank you so much. And I'm happy that we capture your talk. Um, I know many of your talk has always been very inspiring, starting from day one when I met you. Um, you. I'm very happy that you're working with a lot of people um, that we both know. Um, and thank you for the inspiring talk. And I hope to be able to bring you back in person sometime. <laughs> and so for you I'd to- I'd love to. Yeah, all the, all the things we're doing here as well. And thank you everybody for the talk, for attending the talk. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been such a great pleasure for me. Wish okay. I could be in person. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right.